Hi, Johan Swart again, and welcome to the third video in my series on the Burbul Breed Standard. I must say the first two videos have been hugely well accepted, and uh, therefore I'm going to do a third one. And uh, before I go back to the Mythbuster series, I really want to bring this point across. This is a critical point and this is something that I hear so many people talking about and they all seem to assume that what they are saying is right and it all has to do with what the dog looks like, right? And the common term that is used is I've got this type of burbul, I've got a houndy type of burbul or I've got a mastiff type of burbul I don't know what types they describe, but I hear about short leg type burbles and long leg type burbles and long body burbles and compact burbles. Man, there is no such thing, right? The breed standard describes a certain number of things, and these things I think can be summarized in the words angulation, relations. Relations between one part of the body and another part of the body and and levels Levels right a certain part of the body will be in a certain level relationship with another part of the body now The first thing that we've got to look at here and that was very important to the old appraisers and for us to understand what the dog should look like in the breed standard, in the original breed standard, and as I said, I use the SABT's old breed standard, I use the Ibasa breed standard, I use the Kusa breed standard, I use the Burbul International breed standard. Right. In all these breed standards, there was a very important relationship. And that was the relationship, first, of the body length, body length, versus body height. Now, obviously, this is going to rule out all the long leg and all the short leg burbles, right? And all the long body and the short body burbles. The breed standard is very specific. And it says that the relationship between the length of the body is 10 units, right? Let me use another color pen. Right, is 10 units and the body height is 9 units. Now, I haven't seen many appraisers even trying to measure this it's something that you can see and it's if it's out it's out it's very simple yes we do allow a slightly longer body for females because over time it has shown that it gives more carrying capacity for larger litters slightly longer not an elongated sausage dog with burbul legs look i know some guys have managed to cross sausage dogs and burbles but the result is not a burbul. The body length is wrong. So if the body length and the body height do not match in the correct relationship, we know that we have to cut that. The second important thing, and the second thing addresses also one of the new fallacies about the breed, right? The second thing is the length of the muzzle, length. I'm making notes here because this will be the first of a series of lectures. There's no ways I can handle this tonight. Right. The length of the muzzle versus the roof of the skull. Now, that is very important because I hear all these things about houndy dogs that have got longer noses and longer ears and narrower heads. Let's look what the breed standard says. The breed standard says the length of the nose, the nasal, area of the dog if you measure that in units and you measure from the middle of the stop of the dog to the tip of the nose is two units and the length of the roof of the skull is three units guys it's as simple as that so if a dog has a nose that is three units and the roof of the skull is two units it's wrong it's incorrect the relationship is very important. So bigger dogs with bigger skulls can still have nose, roof of skull relationships that are correct. Smaller dogs with smaller skulls can still have it correct. In the beginning, I was taught that the nose should be about four fingers long. And later, one of the old appraisers came up and said, no, no, no. 
What we have to do is measure it. Measure all those dogs that we think are correct. And then we come up with a relationship. We write down this, the centimeters. And let me tell you, we've measured a hell of a lot of dogs. And eventually we found it. It's two levels there, two units there, three units there. So that's part of the relations that describe what this dog should look like. Right. Now, the next thing, which is also very critically important, and which defines this breed very well, because the head describes a lot about this breed, is the planes of the muzzle and the roof of the skull. Now, I've seen dogs nowadays with like hook noses, right? And, and around heads and things like that. The breed standard, and I'll get to the head in detail later. I'll do a full video, or more than one maybe, just on the head of the dog, right? But it says very clearly that the plane, that the, the, the nose, the plane of the nose, the nasal bone, and the plane of the roof of the skull should be identical. They should be on the same plane. In other words, even though the one is higher than the other, they are on the same plane. It's not the nose dipping or the nose tilting. It's not the roof of the skull doing this and you can't see if that roof of the skull has, is on the same plane as the nose. If that happens, you have to give this dog uh, some penalization because that is not correct. To have a rounded skull or a skull that goes up with a tip or a skull that angles downwards is not correct. And if you look at the dogs that people should describe as correct. Now, people, I really want to focus on this. You can't ask Facebook if your dog is correct. It's like asking Facebook if your girlfriend is pretty. It does not work, right? Do not take the opinion of Dr. Facebook and go and treat yourself if you're sick, right? Do not measure your dog on the Facebook opinion of, ooh, ah, and that is the the regal dog champion of them all that everybody believes in when that dog is really a very poor example of the breed. I see dogs being sold for fortunes and then I take that dog and I measure it according to the breed standard and shame the poor guy who paid so much money for that dog didn't buy a very good example of the breed. Maybe he bought a hell of a lot of hype and maybe he's going to get a lot of attention because he's got the most expensive burble in the world. But people, please, is that dog very good according to the breed standard? If I look back at some of the old champions of the previous era, and, and I think, why were these dogs made champion? Sometimes they were made champions because their owners were very important. Sometimes they were made champions because they wanted to draw the owner from another organization over to an uh, to a certain organization and then they made his dog a champion in there. Some of the champions were made because were made champions because of errors, admitted errors. I believe we should look at each dog individually and measure it according to the standard. There is no other measure but the standard. Okay, right. Let's go to the fourth aspect because I've got a hell of a lot here. I better start moving. Right. The fourth aspect which is critically important to the look and the appearance of the dog is the block shape on the skull. Now, that's also a relationship, right? Block shape, right? On the skull, right? The block shape of the skull means that the length and the width of the skull is a block, it's a cube. The muzzle, if you look at it from the top, it's a smaller cube, right? But those are cubes. They are not elongated. But they, they, they are cubes, they are square. The sides are of equal length, right? The roof of the skull and the muzzle, right? You must have a look and those are actually like square little boxes that fit together and taper into each other with the stop of the dog, right? The next thing, which is very important, which also talks about angulation, relation, and levels, right? The next very important thing is the length of the lips and the jaw. Guys, this is so well described in all the breed standards. It says that your upper lip, right? Your upper lip should never go below the bottom line of your jaw. Now, I see dogs nowadays which are giving uh, the long-lipped dogs of this world a very good go. The whole head is just skin and skin flaps hanging down. 
It is wrong. The breed standard says your lips should be tight. It should be tight, not loose flaps and with the drool coming out the corners, right? It should be tight, the lips, and the top lip should just should never go below the bottom of, of, of the lower jaw, and it must just cover the teeth in front, right? It must just cover the teeth in front. The lower lip should be firm, but we'll get to the lips when we get to the head, but the length of the lips is very important. The length of the lips and the length of the jaw. Read the breed standard. It talks about overbite and what is acceptable. It talks about underbite and what is acceptable. Right. So what is a disqualification? Do you know which one? It's time to read your breed standard. Right. The next thing that we have to look at is the length of the ears. Guys, it's becoming complex. Now, you know, you, you get a guy that says, oh, you know what, that dog, I don't like it. I think its angulation is out. All the relationships are not good. Which relationship is he talking about? Which angle is he talking about? I'm going to handle 19 different aspects here today. Very, very quickly. Just mention them and then we will go into detail later. But the length of the ears. How long should a burro's ears be? Do they houndy type really? Do we allow in the breed standard them to have longer ears and the really master types to have really short ears? No, the breed standard is very exact. If you pull the ear, slight pressure downwards, it should reach the corner of the mouth. Right? And that gives you the correct length of the ears. If the ears are wrong, if they're too long, etc., there are penalizations. The shape of the ear, the thickness of the ear, everything is described in the breed standard. But we will get back to that when we come to, to the full video, just on the head of the dog, right? Then of critical importance, point number seven. And that is something that very most appraisers miss. And that's also why you get the long leg and the short leg and all that confusion. And it's described in the breed standard, in all the old breed standards in any case. It's the midpoint of the forequarter. All the front limbs, right? Now, what does that mean? It means that the elbow of the dog, right, which sits about there, should be halfway between the top and the bottom. So that equals that, right? So if you find a dog where the elbow is down here, so it's got short little lower legs, this is incorrect. The breed standard describes very clearly that the elbow should form the midpoint between the top of the withers and the ground. Right? And that should give the dog a lot of balance and mobility, and it will have a big impact on mobility, right? Then, we get to the first real angulation issue. Now, I hear people saying, oh, this dog's angulation is good. Which angulation are you talking about? There are heaps of different angles that we are looking at. The first angulation is the alignment of the forelimbs from the front and the side. Guys, you have to look at the dog coming running towards you and the forelimbs must go vertical to the ground. Bandy-legged dogs, knocked knee dogs out, right? You have to penalize them. It is impacting on the mobility and the correct uh, movement of this animal and this breed, right? So, if you look at the forelimb from the side, it should be straight to the ground, right? If you look at it from the front, the two limbs should be parallel and straight to the ground, right? They should form nice, parallel, strong trunks. If you go and you have that type of leg, wrong! And if it's very badly wrong, don't just penalize, man. If it affects this dog's mobility very bad, disqualify it. You're a judge and you're paid for your professional opinion. You are not paid to let dogs through this, this, this selection methodology without applying the rules. Right? The next thing that we have to look back, and this is so critical. Unfortunately, many of the other breeds have picked it up. Burbul seems to have missed it so far, right? Is the layback angle angle of the scapula. What is the scapula? Guys, it's time to start learning some terms. 
The scapula is, in Afrikaans, the black bean. Right. It is the scapula, it is this bone that sits here. Right, you can feel the little tip there at the top. Right, now, very important, and this is an angle, it's part of the angulation of the dog that you must understand. This angle must be well laid back. It must lean backwards quite sharply. Why? This determines how far the dog can actually extend its front paw when it runs. If this layback angle is very steep, this dog can only stretch his front paws up to there. If the layback angle is a well, a good layback angle, right, this dog can extend his front legs properly and the mobility is greatly improved and impacted by that, right? <sighs> now, I'm getting tired, but I better finish this, right? Number 10, front angulation. Now, I think when a lot of appraisers talk about the angulation of this dog is out, they're only looking at the front, right? The front angulation is the angle that is formed between the top. You take two lines, you draw one from the top of the scapula to the front sh uh, shoulder joint. You can clearly feel it on the dog. And then you go from there back to the elbow, right? That is the front angulation we are talking about, right? That is the front angulation. If you can't see it clearly on a dog, take a piece of, of, of masking tape and stick it on there at the top, at the tip of the scapula at the top, bring it to the front angle, put it on the hair, that piece of masking tape, break it off, then go from there back to the elbow and leave it on the dog. And see the dog running and see how that angle stays the same, right? Now that angle in the Burbul breed is described as between 90 to 110 degrees, right? That is the angle that is allowed internationally for most master breeds as well. Okay, let's come to angle number 11. The angle of the croup. The croup is the pelvis of the dog. It is this angle over here. All right, that is the angle of the croup. And you can clearly feel it. What I normally do is I take my pen and I push it down there. I touch the dog to know the temperament of the dog, to see what does this dog do if I push there with my pen. Fortunately, I'm far from the sharp end of the dog, so if it turns around to come, ah, I know I can jump out of the way and I can go and make my note there, temperament, okay, now no, when I'm going to score the temperament, I'm gonna give this dog a very bad score. Okay, but that is the croup, the angle of the croup. Now, the steeper the angle of the croup is, the more we tend to get a leg that goes that way. The angle of the croup determines the start of your angulation for the rear. Because the hip joint, the socket, sits there. So if you turn that angle like this, you're going to get a leg that goes like that. If you turn the angle too much like that, you're going to get a leg that goes like that. Dogs that look like hyenas, with a back end down, and dogs that look like wheelbarrows with a back end up, right, is mostly to do with the angle of the croup that is incorrect. So the angle of the croup is also defined, and that should be about 22,5 degrees, right? The half of 45 degrees, it's easy to remember. 45 degrees is like that, 22 and a half is half of that. That is what the angle of the croup should be. Okay, now we get to angle number 12, talking about angulation relations and level. Okay, the front pastern angulation. Okay, the front pastern angulation. What is the pastern? The pastern is this little section between the foot and the top leg, right? Now that front pastern has got a little angle there, right? And that is very important to look at that little angle. Because if that angle goes flat like this, the dog has got collapsed pasterns. If it goes straight down like that, this dog has got a straight front leg. That is the shock absorber of the dog. But we will get into that much later, right? When we discuss the front part, the whole front structure of the dog. And I will go into that in detail. But that angle is also defined, right? And it's an angle to the vertical. That it is defined, right? Okay, the next thing, item 13, is the rear pastern, right? Rear pastern. Now, rear pastern alignment is you look at the dog from the back. 
while the dog is running away from you. And the rear pastens must be solid. It must not be swinging out like this, like the dog is trying to spell ox with its legs, right? And it goes away, or it should not be banded in, right? The rear pastern alignment should follow the line of the leg. And as we already said, the legs should be vertical to the ground and in a straight line. So if you get to the bottom and the rear pastern is turning out like this, or even the front pasterns, when you look at any of the pasterns, and that pastern is instead of facing straight forward, is turned out like this, or turned in like this, or even one turned in, and the other one turned out, you have a crippled dog, right? Simple way to see if the dog is moving correctly, and a nice cheat, and to see if the pasterns are actually used properly, is look at the length of the toenails of the dog. A dog that runs on normal surfaces, surfaces etc., all the toenails should be nice and equally worn. If you look at a dog that has got the inside two toenails very long and these ones short and worn to the quick, what happens is the dog is putting his foot down on that side. The pastern is not allowed level, uh, aligned levelly and the dog is not moving well on that. It's moving on the sides of its feet. Equally so when the nails on the inside wear down and the nails on the outside are long. Watch that. It gives a very good indication of what is, what is wrong. Okay, I better move it. Right, angle 14. Okay, rear pastern alignment and then the rear pastern angulation. Okay, rear pastern angulation. That talks about cow hocks and it talks, talks about sickle hocks, etc. Detail that we will get to. But that is basically how does this pastern, now the rear pastern is much longer than the front pastern, how does this, this fit onto the rest of the road leg? Does it go at a sharp angle? Does it go slightly like this or does it go absolutely straight? Now those are terms that we will handle later when we look at the rear hind quarter of the dog. Right, now we get to the another big angulation thing. And as I said, when most appraisers look at the front angle of the dog, they forget to look at the rear angulation. And if they look at the rear angulation, I think they miss a lot of things. Right, rear angulation is critically important. The rear angulation is from the hip joint down to the, the back um, knee. Right, and from the back knee to the 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 the, the hock back here. Right, from there to the hock. Now these two angles, and there you can see already a fault in this dog. Right, I just took an old picture of the dog and I projected it on here. I'm not such a good artist, and I just drew a copy of it. Right now, if you look at this angle, this rear angulation, what do you see? This angle here should also be 90 to 110 degrees. Now some uh, appraisers will tell you, oh, your rear angulation is straight. And there are breeders, really important breeders, and their dogs are considered very highly, and some of them were even champions. They have got virtually no rear angulation. That rear angle is nearly 180 degrees. It is out, it is horrible, and they are breeding with those dogs, and they are They've been severely inbred and a lot of them are carrying that trait over to other dogs. But this angle, let's call it R, right? And call that F. These two should match. F equals R, right? The front angulation must match the rear angulation. So if this one is 90 degrees, that one should be 90 degrees. If you don't get that, the dog bunny hops. It runs with its front legs and the back legs are coming like bunny hops behind, right? That is the cause of it. The second thing in the rear angulation is that the length of the, the legs of this angle should be the same, right? You should, the lower thigh should be the same length as the upper thigh. And that is critical in angulation to accept that, right? The next thing that is critically important, and I see a lot of guys say, ooh, look at that top line. Top line is simply this line at the top of the dog, right? And that should be, according to the breed standard, level, right? It should be level. It must not run downhill. It must not sag like, like, like a big dipper. And it must not go in a bulge. This is a level top line, right? Item 17 in angulation and relationships. And now, I think you guys are all confused, but the next time somebody tells you and say, Listen, your angulation of your dog does not look good. Tell him where, which angle is not looking correctly or which relationship is incorrect, right? 
The next is the length of the loin versus the rib cage. Now, the loin is this little section here. Right? If you feel, that is where only the spine supports the body. Right? There's no ribs here. Right? That is the rib cage, and we all know that. That part is the rib cage. That part is the loin. Right? The length. The loin should be one third, and the rib cage should be two thirds. Right? That's the relationship that we are working on there. If you have that, you have a correct relationship. Right? We're not talking about the width and everything and the musculature of the, the, the loin yet. That I will do when I get into the detail. This is overview stuff, people. Now number 18. Right, and <laughs> this is something very important. And it's quite important, but I don't really see guys testing it. And that is the angle of attachment of the penis. Right, now why the hell would that be important? Because if you have a serious droop and the dog jumps up, he cannot get it in. Right, it should be tightly tucked against the body, right, and that is what the breed standard describes. So if you see a champion dog and the wriggling runs runs to the to the floor and it's it's pointed at the back heels, it is wrong. That dog cannot mate properly. And if he made a lot of offspring, he was probably just used for artificial insemination, right? That dog cannot naturally mount a female without some assistance by the owner. And I, I don't really like doing that, right? I believe it should happen quite naturally. Right, and now we get to the last point, item 19 of angulation. And that is something I nearly left out. And that is the paw shape and angulation. You can get pastons, legs that are nicely aligned, pastons that are nicely aligned, but when you, get, when you get to the paws, they are east-west. they just at the bottom, they turn all wild directions. <coughs> the paws should straight for, face straight forward, and they would, if, if they're not, the dog cannot move properly. Okay, right, I think tonight we covered a hell of a lot of ground. Okay, this is a broad overview. I'm going to go into much more detail, and I want to ask you, Ooh, if you are still thinking you can be appraisers quickly, come for a weekend course and then I, <coughs> I tell you, you can now go and you can appraise dogs. It takes years and years and years of practice and looking at the dogs. All of this has to be in your memory and this is only the angulation relations and levels. We haven't looked at the head, we haven't looked at the neck, we haven't looked at the trunk, we haven't looked at the rear quarter, the fore quarter. All of those things we must still look at. And remember, during this process, we're consistently monitoring the temperament of the dog and the mobility of the dog so that we can give good scores on that. Or not good scores, informed scores. Okay, so let's get back to reality. I wrote a book. The book is called The Burbul, The Revision of the History and the Origin of the Dog. The Origins and the History. The book is selling incredibly well. The second print is now finished, right? It is gone, it's all sold out. The third print is already ordered and it should be available very soon. Fortunately, we found a printer that works very rapidly um, and it will have a different front cover to the first one and the second one it will be a different book. Um, the, the content is basically the same. If you are interested in ordering this book, please send me an email to burbulbook at gmail.com burbulbook at gmail.com the next thing is, I'm again only going to put a short teaser of this video on Facebook. Because what I found is people watch the whole video on Facebook and they don't click through to my YouTube channel. And what I want is, I want you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please, because then if I issue another video, you will be notified. You'll get an email automatically, you won't get spam or nothing. You will get an email that says, Johan Swart published another video. So then you can decide if you want to go and watch it. If you watch it and you like it, please click like. Right? I would appreciate it. Give me comments. So far, I haven't received many negative comments. People are very supportive of what I'm trying to do and I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. But show your appreciation. Go to my channel. Like it. Send me a message. Make a comment on, on the video. Right? And I am... I'm, 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 I'm very happy to reply to all of that. This is a heap of information. But over the next X number of videos, we will spell all of this out and we will make it clear. Okay, I thank you. And <laughs> spend some time digesting this. This video you can watch 
a number of times and you will learn every time that you watch it. Goodbye.